So our uh, first uh, invited speaker uh, is Ryan Bogdan, uh, who's an associate professor in psychological and brain sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, he does uh, an incredible breadth of work at the intersection of um, psychiatry and behavioral genetics and cognitive psychology. Uh, he's particularly interested in how um, you know, genetic uh, differences between individuals interact with environmental variables and how to, in cases of uh, psychopathology and disorder, and how this is mediated by neurobiological mechanisms. Uh, so really uh, an impressive translational program, and he's going to talk about using genetics to test the plausibility of causality and predisposition in neuroimaging, alcohol, and brain Thank you. Please welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you all for having me. Um, we are very interested in psychiatric classification and using neuroimaging and genetic markers to understand risk and consequences. One of the things we constantly struggle with in clinical neuroimaging is we're dealing with associations. And is this a predispositional risk factor? Is it a possible consequence of the factor? And if you read different literatures, how this cross-sectional data is interpreted can vary greatly. If you're reading depression anxiety literature, any brain correlation is a predispositional risk factor for this. If you start to read <coughs> substance use literature, everything is interpreted as a consequence of using the substance. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some, uh, a variety of intuitive methods we've used to try to tease apart those things. And I want to start, before I get going, really acknowledging David Berenger, who is a PhD student in our neuroscientist program. He's doing a postdoc now with Erica Forbes at the University of Pittsburgh. And then Catherine Beemers, who's uh, on our clinical internship right now in, in, in Denver. And they did the majority of this work, so I'm fortunate that I get to present it. Um, but so one thing we're interested in is alcohol use disorders and substance use disorders. As I'm sure you guys are all aware, these are incredibly problematic. They're a leading preventable cause of death associated with a host of negative outcomes. The stat I find kind of uh, most intuitively appealing is this idea that each drink that is had in the United States costs society a little over $2. Um, not associated with production and any of those sorts of things, but the actual consequences to uh, society. And if you look at this also, you have much greater rates of psychopathology. So individuals who use alcohol are much more likely to suffer from other forms of, uh, of psychopathology. Um, and there's been some recent work um, that was just published a few months ago showing that actually alcohol consumption is associated with DNA damage. Um, so alcohol has been associated with a lot of bad things. If you were alive in the 1980s in the Reagan era, um, attack on drug war, uh, the, the drug war, I'm sure you're familiar with this commercial. Right? The idea that drug use is causing damage to your brain. <coughs> and that is really how the majority of neuroimaging associations have been interpreted in, uh, with regard to alcohol use. So these are some of the largest studies. This top one is looking at individuals with alcohol use disorder. So these are individuals who develop really problematic patterns of alcohol drinking, mostly dependent on um, so building up tolerance to the substance and those sorts of things. And we have down here is a study of alcohol consumption among psychiatric individuals, uh, individual psychiatric diagnoses as well as healthy controls. Essentially, you show similar patterns of brain volume reduction. So I have never seen a report of volumetric increases among um, individuals using uh, alcohol um, heavily or even more moderately. Um, but essentially, what you see is drastic reductions in brain matter volume across the brain, in particular in the anterior cingulate cortex. The, um, frontal cortex, in particular the medial and uh, superior frontal gyri, and then some big hits in the insulin cerebellum as well. Um, and this has been pretty consistent, so fairly well replicated finding. And again, most of this has been interpreted to be the consequence of drinking, even more moderate drinking. And there is some evidence to support that. This is a study in rhesus macaques where they actually experimentally uh, uh, manipulate alcohol. They made some of them drink quite heavily. And what you essentially see is reduced neural proliferation in the hippocampus, less immature neurons. So the idea that this is experimental evidence that actually alcohol use is blunting neurogenesis would be the idea here. Um, there's some evidence also in human literature. There have been some neat studies where they've scanned individuals before they've gone into inpatient treatment for alcohol use disorder and then scanned them later. Um, so what you see here are healthy controls in the darker bars and then alcohol dependent <coughs> individuals in the lighter bars. This was before um, receiving treatment, and this is after sustained abstinence for two weeks, uh, verified with biological markers and the like as well. And what you see is that essentially patients um, who are abstinent have brain volumetric increases that are essentially normalizing folic acid. So again, this has been interpreted as evidence that perhaps alcohol is causing this atrophy. 
You know, this is a can of worms. It can be opening up a host of different things like dehydration, all of these things that are obviously going to be affecting brain fog. Um, there have been some studies by Encanda in particular. Um, so this is a multi-site study centered primarily out of UCSD. It's kind of the precursor to the ABCD data project. They recruited kids when they were about 12 and have followed them up every year with imaging and assessing alcohol use. Um, and they have some trajectory analyses essentially showing that individuals who start drinking during the course of their study have steeper gray matter volume declines. So in typical development, gray matter volume declines over time, but those that are initiate heavy episodic drinking, binge-like drinking, essentially show steeper declines. Um, so again, all of this is interpreting in the context of causality. One thing I want to know with this Encanda study is actually if they put family history into the mix, these findings go away entirely. So there could be some evidence of predisposition actually causing those differential trajectories that are then creating vulnerability um, for, for drinking. Um, very little research has actually looked at whether these volumetric differences might be predispositional. Um, so this is one study from uh, Bill Iacono's group where they looked at uh, participants and relatives of individuals with alcohol use disorder. And what you're looking at here is just brain volume and amygdala. So here you have current and past AUV. This graph over here is just them combined. So it's the this, this same data point, to, excuse me, as, as these two. And these are their first degree relatives who are unaffected, who don't have alcohol dependence. They, they might be drinking alcohol, but they're, they're not dependent. And here are further removed relatives and then unrelated, unaffected controls. And there's a stepwise relationship that would be suggesting um, some evidence of possible predisposition. Or if you're related to somebody with drinking problems, you actually have reduced volume. Um, and this is in the amygdala. They had a, a few other regions that showed this pattern. Uh, this is, but this is the only um, study I'm aware of that's actually showing some evidence of predisposition. And this is, you know, possibly largely due to motivations to show from, you know, funding agencies to show that alcohol has been different. Um, so we started a, a study. Um, across a host of samples to see if we could first identify replicable associations with alcohol consumption and brain volume, and then see if we might be able to borrow from more typical behavioral genetics to see if we could put some directional arrows on this using essentially family-based study methods. And then if we do find that, can we prospectively predict alcohol use in alcohol-naive individuals in a longitudinal perspective framework? And then can we uh, use genome-wide association studies to see if we find evidence of increased transcription, uh, increased genomic risk for alcohol in the brain region we're identifying. So um, to do this, we started with the Duke Neurogenetic Study. So this is something I worked on uh, when I was a postdoc with Amon Ravieri at Duke. Um, it's about 1,300 uh, college students, not all from Duke, but from the greater North Carolina area for the most part. And we also worked with the Human Connectome Project, the 900 subject data release. So this is a family-based study. It's got MZ twins, DZ twins, and uh, non-twin siblings up to five um, sibling pairs per, per family, and they're kind of restricted to be within a, a four-year range, which is somewhat nice for a family-based study because then they're being exposed to a very similar familial environment. You don't have you know, a child who is two and their sibling is 12, where they could be experiencing very different things um, in their family environment. So 1,300 individuals, 900 individuals, um, slightly different age ranges, um, some different demographic uh, compositions, but relatively large samples for neuroimaging. We took a couple of different analytic approaches. We used uh, just typical voxel-based morphometry in the DNS, um, because that's how we've been analyzing those data. We've subsequently done some free surface analyses and showed exactly the same patterns. Um, and for the Human Connectome Project, we used FSL and Palm. And this is important because it is a related data set. So the measures of non-independence, we have to account for that kinship matrix when looking at any correlation. Otherwise, we're going to kind of minimize our standard errors and blow up our significance levels uh, unnecessarily so. So to begin with, um, these are just our whole brain regressions of WE.05 corrected, essentially, in the DNS. And we do identify about seven different clusters. Um, one other thing I want to point out is we're able to include a lot of covariates um, that are associated with alcohol use and brain volume, things like childhood maltreatment, all of those sorts of things, which have slightly reduced the size of some of these clusters. Uh, but they're robust to those inclusions. They're there also if there's no covariates there, essentially. Um, but a couple of them that I want to, so, yeah, so um, we have uh, some hits in the, essentially the, the frontal cortex, particularly the middle superior and superior frontal gyrus, and the insula are the, the strongest findings here. And then we have adopted an ROI approach and essentially used all of these ROIs, put them into one ROI, and then after we corrected in the HCP, and essentially find two replications. 
Um, we find uh, uh, reduced insular volume in the HCP, as well as uh, reduced volume in both the middle and superior frontal gyrus. Um, these are not entirely overlapping at these significance levels. We reduce that threshold at all, they blur together, essentially. So we, we think this is a nice evidence of, uh, of replication and anatomical replication. Um, and then I want to note, this is not really new. This is largely replicating this prior work, right? We're finding the same regions, which feels wonderful, and we're able to replicate it internally. Um, so that's where we started. Not particularly interesting, but now we can leverage that family-based data to try to put some directional errors on these relationships. So we started with just some basic heritability estimates using this family-based data. Nothing particularly new here either, but it's refreshing to see it replicating what the literature says, and that alcohol consumption is moderately heritable, about 0.5, just like what the literature says, and our brain volume metrics are really pushing the upper boundaries of psychiatric uh, heritability, around 80%. Um, this is where it gets more interesting. So with the family-based data, we can partition this genotypic correlation. So what we did was we extracted the whole anatomical volume from these regions to you know, address double dipping concerns, essentially. And this is the phenotypic concern of our brain regions, um, the, ins the frontal, um, middle, superior frontal gyrus, and then here the insula. And those are negatively correlated with alcohol consumption. So the more alcohol you're cons consuming, the re more reduced volume you have there. But then we can take that phenotypic correlation and based on the family structure, deconstruct the sources of, var of variance in that. Is it attributable to shared genetic influences that are affecting brain volume and alcohol consumption? Or are they unique genetic aspects? Or are there environmental aspects that are influencing both brain volume and uh, alcohol consumption? And what we find here is that it's all genetic. And this is the proportion of variance explained. It's relatively, you know, a small portion of variance explained. It's plotted negatively just to, uh, to display the directionality of the association, right? So that essentially the latent genetic makeup that is conferring reduced brain volume is conferring increased alcohol consumption. So this association between brain volume and alcohol consumption seems, from these data at least, and a you know, relatively non-disordered population, seems to be primarily attributable to predisposing genetic risk as opposed to uh, con uh, consequences of alcohol. And a more intuitive way to look at this, I think, is to use a really powerful kind of old epidemiological design, uh, discordant sibling design. So here we can put together a couple of contrasts um, to kind of test whether these data reflect causality, uh, alcohol causing these brain volume differences or a predispositional effect. So what we did here was we took um, twins and non-twin siblings and essentially defined them as being concordant for being a high drinker or concordant for being a low drinker. So again, that can be about up to five you know, pairs within each family, so we could have multiple pairs going across these different groups, essentially. But you'd either have you know, siblings who are both drinking a lot, siblings who are both not drinking a lot, and then most interestingly, discordant siblings, right? Where they're being raised in the same family environment and have a lot of the shared you know, familial genetic background. And those individuals who are discordant, who are either high or low in drinking, can really be used to, to test this possibility of predisposition, right? If they look the same, that would be suggesting that it's a predispositional vulnerability factor as opposed to a consequence of that. So these are represented um, largely by these graphs here. So for example, here it would be a concordant um, non-drinker, concordant high drinker, and then discordant ones. If this was a causal relationship, this is the pattern we'd expect to see, right? Where individuals who are drinking have the reduced volume, but if you're related to an individual who's drinking, you look normative on your brain. Um, in contrast to this, the C estimate over here would be the would be evidence of predisposition, where only the individuals who are concordant for not drinking have elevated brain volume, while all of those who are not drinking um, have uh, have reduced, uh, excuse me, who are drinking or related to the who are drinking have reduced volume. And so this would be a, a straight predispositional effect. The other effect we can hypothesize would be a graded liability. Perhaps the individuals who are discordant have some protection against alcohol relative to those who are both concordant, right? Because otherwise both of them would be drinking. And then we might find something like this, where their brain volumes are kind of intermediate to those who are concordant for low or concordant for high drink. So when we look at the data, what we find is evidence for predisposition and graded viability. So this is our insula ROI. Um, so here's our concordant low drinkers, um, concordant high drinkers, and then our discordant pairs. And essentially, all of these individuals are lower um, than the concordant um, low drinkers. And there is evidence of graded liability 
where these individuals are intermediate between these two. So it also, that grade liability could be evidence of predispositional effects also having causal effects on top of that. When we look at the frontal, um, the middle and superior frontal gyrus, we essentially see only evidence of predisposition. So all of these are just lower, essentially, than the um, concordant non or low gyrus. And when it says we've done this, these, uh, all of our associations, even removing people who didn't, do not drink at all, and we see very similar patterns, because there could be many reasons that, that people aren't drinking. Um, so just to summarize at this point, we were able to identify replicable reduction in gray matter volume in the frontal and insula cortices. Um, it'll replicate that internally. And then we're able to start to put some arrows on. It does seem to be that those differences that are associated with genetic, uh, with alcohol consumption are associated with genetic predisposition as opposed to a causal consequence. Um, and in particular, I, think, I find the sibling discordancy analysis very uh, compelling where they look um, quite, quite similar. So this would be really suggestive of predispositional risk as opposed to consequence. So if it is predispositional, we should be able to use these data to then predict the um, prospective alcohol consumption, right? So the Duke Neurogenetics study does have a longitudinal component. Um, we emailed out um, follow-up surveys, including questions about alcohol consumption every three months after study participation. People completed a variety of these. I wish we could have uh, reinforced it a little more. We only were able to give out Amazon gift cards and a lottery. So the sample is not exactly the same as the, the, the full sample, but a, a good portion of them completed. But it is more white, more conscientious, um, less stress overall in the sample that, that, that did complete these. Um, but we were able to then look at whether our brain volume was predicted of alcohol consumption over time and after controlling for baseline differences in brain, uh, brain uh, excuse me, in alcohol consumption. So this is what we find. So this would be um, the, the values in these groups here, representing if they have low, high, or average volume in these frontal, uh, these frontal uh, region of interest. And this is the age of the individual. So all of these represent different data points. There's a lot of missing data here. It was quite the pain to analyze these. Um, but what we do find is that essentially people who had low brain volume in these frontal cortices um, had increased alcohol consumption, but only up until age 21. So it actually falls out at like 20.8 or something like that. So it seems like there's a physical risk factor for possibly drinking in the context that would be violating social norms with regard to the legality of drinking. So this is interesting, but um, you know it's also a sample that was already exposed to alcohol at, at baseline when we conducted these scans. So we reached out to a colleague, um, Douglas Williamson, who was at San Antonio at the time. He's now at, at Duke as well. Um, he has a sample of adolescents. Um, it's about 330 of them overall that he got when they started at 12. And then he scanned them every two and a half years and has measures of alcohol consumption in a longitudinal framework. Um, so we took out everybody who had reported any alcohol use prior to beginning the study. So we had a sample of about 240 kids, around 12 and a half years, um, who had never been exposed to alcohol. And we had brain structure metrics on that. And then we were able to uh, look about six years out, and about half of the sample, almost 40 ish percent, did initiate alcohol drink. So we were able to see if our baseline measure of brain structure was predictive of the initiation of drinking at, a, at an age as well as the amount. And what we find is that essentially these low volumes in the frontal cortis, cortex, the middle superior frontal gyrus, are predictive of an earlier age of drinking, um, as demarcated by this blue and purple line, relative to individuals who have this uh, who have more volume in that region. Um, this, um, I'm only pre presenting here the probability of alcohol consumption in regard to age of onset, but we do find them drinking more as well. Um, so um, we, we have explored you know, what mechanisms might be contributing to this, largely, you know, in particular, inspired by some of the work suggesting that it kind of falls off at age 21. So we looked at a host of different kind of <coughs> psychological constructs that might be mediating this. So we looked at things like cognition, IQ, of self-reported impulsivity and behavioral impulsivity, um, as well as negative urgency, or kind of dealing with stress by using substances. Um, we find some kind of nominal levels of significance, but none of these replicate across studies, and none of them survive a PR correction or anything like that. So I wouldn't put a huge amount of faith in this. Um, it was kind of disappointing that we were able to look it up to more kind of behavioral mechanisms. But um, we do have some slightly stronger 
kind of a sensation seeking as opposed to impulsivity itself. Um, so we think that might pan out, but um, for the most part, no hope in behavior connecting this to alcohol consumption. So our longitudinal work shows that this reduced volume is predicting alcohol use up till age 21 in a college sample, and then it's predicting earlier age of initiation among non-exposed individuals. Um, so this really converges in many ways with our um, earlier um, <coughs> genetic analyses, but also suggests that temporality might be really important for understanding these relationships. So the next thing we did was leverage tools largely from uh, pure molecular genetics in examining post-mortem brain ex uh, gene expression with regard to risk for alcohol consumption. So, you know, this, would, this helps us, these different metrics we see, these correlations we see with brain volume, they could emerge through many different ways, right? These genes could be influencing the brain, which is then influencing alcohol use. They could also be influencing the liver. Um, the, the largest genetic hits are actually, for alcohol use, are metabolic. They're what converts alcohol to acetylaldehyde um, and create that very negative, aversive kind of flushing reaction that is protective against alcohol. So they could be influencing the liver, influencing the metabolism of alcohol, that could then be influencing the brain, influencing alcohol use. So we could have a couple of separate independent pathways. So what we did um, was we used GWAS data. I don't know, are you guys familiar with seeing these sorts of graphs? These are known as Manhattan plots. What you're essentially seeing are all the different uh, chromosomes here. And then here is your log-based p-value. This um, cutoff here, the, the red cutoff here, is what's known as genome-wide significant. It's essentially a bond forming fraction for a million tests. The idea that there's a million independent SNPs. So anything rising above this line would be essentially, you, you think of it as a hit that is surviving multiple tests and correction. Um, the largest GWAS of alcohol consumption was just published um, in 2017 by Tony Clark and her colleagues. It relies on data from the UK Biobank. So this is a United Kingdom governmental initiative where they've got about 500,000 people. They've done scanning, they've done um, blood draws, done psychological assessments, and, uh, physical health assessments, everything under the sun. Um, and it's data that's largely available to the community. And there's also genetic data associated with this. Um, but they identified um, essentially around 14 different loci, novel loci that were associated with alcohol consumption. So what we were interested in doing was leveraging these data, these genome-wide association summary statistics, to evaluate where, in what tissue types, genomic risk for alcohol consumption is primarily present. Is it in the brain, is it in the liver? And then further, within that, is it in specific regions of the brain, and do those regions overlap with the regions we're identifying in our neuroimaging analysis? Um, so this is the heritability enrichment analysis. So this is looking at overall SNP contributions. The way it works is it relies on post-mortem mRNA expression. Um, this is relying from the, the GTAX data set, which is something that's available to all researchers. It's about 140 brains um, and other body parts. Um, and it's looking at mRNA expression. Um, and what it does is it looks at the top, you can specialize, you can specify what you're looking at, but we can, the default, and what most people use, is look at genes that are the top 10% of genes that are expressed in a certain tissue. And are those overrepresented with regard to genomic risk for our construct of interest here at alcohol? So just to orient you to this graph, um, these are differently colored according to the p value. This green line would represent very stringent Lanfroni correction. Um, this blue line would represent less stringent FDR false discovery rate correction. And here's the red line representing kind of nominal absolute significance. One thing to point out, all of this stuff that is significant is all brain-based <coughs> stuff. Um, and then I think most interesting to us is this number three hit. Broadly agree in number nine, that actually overlaps entirely with our middle superior frontal gyrus um, finding from our imaging studies. So this is looking at gene expression across the brain, uh, across the whole body, across many tissue types that are available in this data set. But we were also interested, given that stuff, uh, that genes can be very differently expressed in the brain overall, we also try to control for global gene expression in the brain and then look for regional specific associations. And when we do that, um, this broadly area of nine um, which would be overlapping with our uh, region of interest we identified in our region analysis of what it costs now. So we found this very compelling in that it's really providing convergent evidence from one cross-sectional data, sharing this association, family-based data, suggesting that this is largely due to genetic predisposition, longitudinal data showing that we can prospectively predict this, uh, big alcohol consumption based on individual brain volume, and then genome-wide association data showing that risk for alcohol consumption 
is enriched in the regions we're identifying through our imaging analysis. Um, they actually don't have an insula section, so we're going to be able to look at that. So following this, we also used another technique. This is a new technique that was just published a couple of years ago um, by a guy whose first name is Bogdan at UCLA. Um, <laughs> it's called Transcription Wide Association St uh, Study. And what it does is it also relies on these databases of curated gene expression. <coughs> And it relies also on these individuals having been genotyped. So you have brain tissue, genotype data. What you can do is you can essentially impute up genetically conferred transcription, right? You can look at your common genetic variation and say how much of the variability in your mRNA expression in these tissues is attributable to variation within those genes. And then uh, alongside that, the other thing you can do is impute up genetically conferred differences in gene ex expression and see if that's associated with risk for a genome-wide uh, genome study. So what we did here was we applied the, the genome-wide associations uh, study data from the alcohol consumption from the UK BioBank and said, is genomic risk for alcohol consumption associated with genomically conferred differences in mRNA expression in, these different, uh, in different tissue regions? So you're looking at here, instead of chromosomes, are different tissues in the brain, so the nucleus accumbens, putamen, caudate, um, cerebellum, cortex, and here's our Brahmin area 9. This is again using the GTEx data. And um, this would be um, monofromine level of correction. This one here would be FDR. So there are several genes that are differentially expressed in relation to alcohol consumption. And we do find one hit um, above that would be surviving essentially a gene based correction in our uh, tissue of interest as well as three other ones that would be surviving this FDR correction. So we were excited about this. There are some other tissues out there clearly as well, and this um, cerebellar uh, one is actually quite interesting as well. Um, none of these have been identified in prior studies um, or been linked to alcohol or any other psychiatric phenotypes, but we did also replicate this. So there's another data set of postmortem gene expression called common mind. It's not the exact same anatomical definition, but they had a swath of dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex so we took all of these, these four hits that were surviving the FDR correction and saw if they were also associated with uh, genomic risk for alcohol consumption and uh, gene expression in this separate postmortem data set. Two of them were unavailable in, in this data set, unfortunately, but the two that were replicated at nominal levels of significance. So this gave us a little more, more confidence in this. All right, so overall conclusions. We're getting some replicable associations with brain volume. They're prospectively predicting um, alcohol use. Um, they seem to be genetically conferred, and it seems to overlap with genomic risk and gene expression in these tissue types. Um, so I think this suggests that these lower you know, brain volumes might really be reflective of these neural risk factor. Not to say that alcohol might not also be causing atrophy or enhanced pruning in some fashion, but that a good portion of it may be attributable to this. I think this is, uh, you know, using these family-based techniques, using GWAS, integrating these with neuroscience might be able to help show similarities across the data disorders and then parse apart aspects of uh, whether they're predispositional or a consequence of the expression of the disorder. Um, so I guess in some, perhaps we're warned with these different brains um, that that might be as opposed to uh, being put into a frying pan by, by alcohol use at least. And I would also like to emphasize, I don't think this is um, specific to alcohol. Um, I think if we looked at other substances, we'd find the same thing, the same brain region would be also such a vulnerability to them. We just don't have the power to look at it in our sample. Um, even with marijuana use, we don't have heavy of enough use to kind of, in, in my opinion, reliably detect some of these, although we see some very similar associations with marijuana use here. Um, so David and Catherine Gemers were really the people who led a lot of these different from analyses, so leaders of all the, the, the credit for them. I'm also indebted to collaborators who have given us access to all of these. These, data, these large data sets to work with and the funding for everybody. So, um, thank you guys. Um, <laughs>
come up nil. So what you're describing is people that, um, by conventional uh, clinical measures, are essentially identical. So at the level of the mediator, they're essentially identical. Somehow, brain is getting to the distal outcome. So what do you what, what say you to that? <laughs> It's actually what I found interesting as well, and we've struggled with. Um, yeah. In particular, finding you know brain structure metrics um, linking to these behavioral mechanisms, we've always struggled with. Um, whereas we found them a little more clearly with some functional metrics. Um, so it could be that we're not assessing these phenotypes very well. Yeah. Um, in particular, our self-reported impulsivity scale is the Barrett impulsiveness scale, which has relatively poor internal consistency. It's okay. It's where the most widely used measures, but it's not great. Um, we do have a delayed discounting task, which I, I like, but it could be also that in some of these populations, you know, these are not the, the general population across either of these studies. It could be, you know, financial differences are leading to less incentive and all of those sorts of things. So I'm not entirely sold that we are assessing them as well as we could. Um, but other than that, I really, I throw my hands in the air as well. We do see much stronger association with sensation seeking, which we followed up we subsequent to some um, other, uh, some a work that Auburn Holmes has done with cortical thickness in this in this area. Um, so we followed up with that, and we see some more consistent findings. I'm not quite sold on it yet, um, but these ones, it's kind of there, kind of not, and it could be different mechanisms. And then it, it could also be that we um, need more variability in our sample. So you know, like our most of our findings are much better predicted by these middle superior frontal gyrus gyrus ROI, but the insulin one is hanging out there a little bit. And um, there's been some fascinating work looking at lesions in the insula where people are able to, people who've been lifelong stroke, who've been lifelong smokers who have a stroke, are able to like immediately stop cigarette smoking. And it seems to be possibly associated with some of these, you know, cravings and withdrawal related physiological responses. So it could be that, you know, perhaps some of this being conferred through different mechanisms as well that, you know, we don't have quite enough variability there, but if we, if we did, we might be able to pick that up. And then the other thing I want to emphasize, it's very small effects. We're not accounting for a large portion of variance, which to me is refreshing because these are complex behaviors. There's got to be all kinds of different parts to them. Um, but so it could be that we, we would just need a larger sample to actually detect those. Yeah. This is very interesting. Thank you. And um, I apologize if you said this um, and I missed it. But um, so the volumetric reduction is mostly attributed to gray matter reduction, or do you have measures of white matter as well? Yeah, so we do have white measure of white matter is gray matter reduction. Is what we looked at gray matter volume is what our analysis looked at. And we do see corresponding white matter increases, which is very consistent with the alcohol literature alongside that. Um, but uh, we have looked at cortical thickness subsequently as well. We looked at volume primarily because that's where almost all of the substance use literature has been previously. So we wanted to start with kind of the, where the literature base was. Cortical thickness, we see some similar hits in these frontal areas as well, but they're, um, I would say, less compelling in that they're a little more finicky, a little more on the borderline, in my opinion. Um, yeah. yeah. You mentioned this a bit at the end. I mean, what, what makes you think that cortical thickness is the causal variable here rather than merely another indicator of some other underlying, uh, you said something about pruning, but uh, I assume there could be there are, there are transmitter differences in these areas or something that are really responsible for the volumetric difference. Yeah, most of and so there could be, it could be genetic differences that are conferring like elevated, um, essentially gray matter pruning during adolescence, for example, that might be also associated with you know, all kinds of behavioral impulsivity, all of those sorts of things. We don't see those, those, those mechanisms here. But it, could, it definitely could be something that's just covariant with uh, substance use. Um, and given that we're not finding these behavioral links, I, I think that increases the possibility of that. Um, yeah, I, thought, I, I was struck by your discordant folks, and yeah. like, you know, wondering if there was some reason why you guys divided it into like the low and the high instead of treating that more um, parametrically, less categorically, more parametrically. And then also, I, did you guys, you probably didn't have the sample to do this, but like look at other factors that would have um, mediated why some did better than others, even though their genetics were very similar. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, I mean, we, we tried that with some of these behavioral measures, but we just didn't have the power. I mean, there's some kind of nominal significant findings there, but nothing that I would hang my hat on. Um, with regard to this approach, to look at discordancy, you do have to categorize it in some ways to compare across the two. We did run a parallel analysis, which is this one, which is looking at it continuously. 
So this is used looking at the phenotypic correlation between substance uh, alcohol use in this case and grain matter volume, and then based on the con continuity of that correlation, then deconstructing it into genetic influence or environmental. So this is continuous. In my opinion, these are kind of showing the same things, but just in different kind of uh, approaches. And I personally find this one very intuitively appealing from a from a hypothetical, um, from a hypothesis. Can I ask another one? Please. Okay. Uh, the insula showed up in uh, the Atkin Teague kind of view that uh, gray matter reductions in, uh, they had dorsal ACC in insula, as I recall, that are kind of tra transdiagnostic. Yep. The, the endpoints, uh, all negative endpoints, mm -hmm. end up. Did, did you find similar things, or did you look at overlap with theirs? Yeah, yeah well, so we, we, we have looked at that, and it is, we do find this reduced insulin volume primarily in the DNS we've looked at this. We haven't looked at it as hard in the HCP, but it is also associated with depression risk and a host of others, um, and anxiety, actually, as well. Um, and then here, but here, we were able to control for those things and still see it associated with alcohol consumption. Um, but I think it is, I definitely, I don't think, I don't think this is specific to alcohol. I don't think it's specific to substances. I think it's probably going to be a general risk factor for that kind of P factor yeah. um, that we would see. Yeah. And that's coming out of the structure of pathology. What are the effect sizes that you're dealing with? Small. We're talking yeah. about like, you know. Real, real. 2% of grains, kind of maximally. Um, that's so, so, yeah. <laughs> Pretty, pretty small, but um, <laughs> I'm coming from somebody who works in genetics, too. Right. Where we get excited about, you know, would our genome-wide significant hits are like 1.06 um, for odd ratios. <laughs> um, so small effects, but I don't think, I think there's one, <clears throat> so being somebody who works in genetics and often collaborates with people outside of genetics, one of the big concerns I hear again and again is these effect sizes are so small, why do we care about them? Um, it's not, never going to be clinically meaningful. Um, I personally think there's a lot of reason for hope, um, and I, I wish I could show you an example of going the way that GWAS discovers something and then treatment is implementing that, it is hitting that and successfully doing so. Um, but I think a, one good example comes from statins, you know, used for cholesterol and heart disease. Um, those were developed in the 70s. We knew the, you know, reductase enzyme that's involved in the synthesis pathway, we could inhibit that. Subsequently, like a genetics came around, there were candidate gene studies of that enzyme, GWAS studies of cholesterol and heart disease, and they identify common genetic variation in that reductase enzyme. But at tiny, uh, tiny effects relative to the effects of statins. So and I think that also makes sense from an evolutionary perspective, that these complex behaviors, things like depression, that might be interfering with re reproductive fitness, it's likely that things that would, would have large effects will get weeded out of the gene. So that what we have left is a, a lot of small effects, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're meaningless from a treatment perspective. So instead of like relying on, you know, people's astute observations that tuberculosis patients responded well to tricyclics and they had positive mood, and then we can use that for antidepressants, and then hey, serotonin's involved in depression. This might allow us to adopt a data-driven approach and view these as kind of flag posts for potential, you know, therapeutic markers um, that then might have very small, you know, effects with regard to common gene variation risk for these disorders, but perhaps large effects for treatment. At least that's my hope. Um, there is there's a neat, nice. Uh, review article by Nelson and colleagues, I think it was 2015, where they looked across medicine and looked at um, medications that were targeting pathways that had GWAS support versus those that did not. Um, and this is all prior to GWAS, largely. So it was kind of subsequent what had GWAS support. And those that did have GWAS support were about twice as likely to proceed um, and show uh, you know, better effects through both, one, both intolerance as uh, with regard to getting through the steps of clinical trials, but then also in outcomes of, for patients as well. Um, and then the other thing that I think is important here is we know there are all tiny, tiny effects, and um, that a lot of, there's a lot of evidence suggesting additivity, where these polygenic risk scores could possibly be useful to kind of undergird overall genomic risk. Um, like if you look at schizophrenia, for example, if you look at the upper decile of polygenic risk for schizophrenia, that gives you an odd ratio of 20, which is ginormous, but from a clinical utilities perspective, I'll bet you all of those individuals have a first degree relative, so we don't need to defrost them, we can just ask them. Yeah. Um, I'm aware of one study in children that showed a predisposition as measured by sweetness preference. Interesting. Uh, 
So I'm wondering, A, whether you have any access to specific data to be in gustatory areas of the brain. Um, but alcohol makes my sleeps. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm still somewhat amazed at how the other question is, do you think anything you presented here could contribute to knowing whether you need to treat people with alcoholism for a month or three months or six months? So, so I'll start with the, the first question. We unfortunately don't have any kind of gustatory or any sweet preferences. Um, we have one um, questionnaire about food consumption in the DNS, but it's not really great. And I have worked with some other data sets that get at um, composition of nutrients, but not very good with sweets. So I, I unfortunately wouldn't be able to follow up on that, but I'd love to. I'm going to have to look at that paper you mentioned now. It sounds fascinating. Um, with regard to the second question, um, I don't think any of this is informative from a clinical treatment standpoint. Uh, from an immediate, you know, applied clinical treatment. I think it's informative for our understanding of etiology and risk and possible mechanisms. But I, I mean, the cost of MRI has remained relatively stable over the last few decades. The cost of genotyping has gone from like $2,000 to as low as $50. So if we're looking at kind of prognostic biomarkers of risk, I think the output my money on genetics as opposed to neuroimaging, um, just from a pure, you know, practicality perspective. Yeah. yeah so um, I was wondering a big picture sense. Um, you know, some, there's sort of model addiction, you know, mainly mediated by the you know dopamine, you know, system of neuroplasticity in the brain and everything, and the, Yeah. And seeing your, your talk, I was wondering, so if you take sort of all, because there are a lot of things that were from the, you know, the people of, you know, it seems like the case that you made really compelling here for these two brain areas and volume could be made for some liver or enzyme, and, Most right? And so I'm wondering if you add up sort of the accumulation of things that are predisposing in this way, do you think that this changes our view of addiction? Um, I think it, no. not currently. <laughs> But I, I think I might be able to. Um, in particular, I, I really like the stage-based theories of addiction that kind of emphasize positive reinforcement for initiation, initial exploration, initial binge drinking, and then the transition of that to more negative reinforcement, trying to get back up to baseline from your mood or trying to with, remove withdrawal symptoms. So I personally think if we, you know, these are relatively crudely phenotype samples. Um, the GWAS are even more crudely phenotype for the most part. Um, but if we can increase some of that precision, I think it might help inform our understanding of how these things are developing by possibly looking at some of these stage-based theories. Um, so in some, I wish this could be informing it now. I don't think we have that kind of global precision. Um, but I think this is suggesting that you know, a lot of the interpretation of these cross-sectional uh, associations as being causal might not be. I'd be happy to talk later, and I'd also be, I'm delighted to always work with people and add genetics to studies, so if you're interested in doing that, I'd be delighted to, to, to chat with you too. Thank you.